Good afternoon, everybody. But this is what we call the disease triangle. It's the basic, your basic understanding to understanding plant disease in your home garden. And what it consists of is actually three things. You need a host, you need a pathogen, and you need the right environment. Without all three of those things being present in your garden, you can't have plant disease. And we're gonna talk a little bit about each of these. You need a susceptible host. Cucurbit powdery mildew is not going to infect your roses in your yard. Or oh, I should say the roses that have powdery mildew or your lilacs that have powdery mildew, that powdery mildew won't infect your cucurbit crops. So you need a host and the right pathogen. All right, you need the right environment. We've had an extremely wet spring so far. The last four weeks in South Jersey, where I'm from, has been terribly wet. And I work mostly with commercial farmers, and they've had a terrible time of actually, first of all, transplanting, but also they have a lot of problems of damping offs and root rots coming in and, and killing their seed uh, before it comes out of the ground or the transplants, you know, as soon as they put them in the ground. Okay. And you need a pathogen. Disease is the exception and typically not the rule. Typically, the problems you have in your home garden are from your own creation. All right. It's something you've done wrong, something you've planted too close together, and your plants are yellow, or some plants are shading out other plants. You're in a shady part of the yard, so your plants aren't getting full sun. You've watered too much. You've watered not enough. Uh, you've put down way too much fertilizer, or you haven't put down any or your dog dug up your tomato plants and decided to chew the tops off. All right. So these disease is often the exception and not the rule. Just because your plants look bad doesn't necessarily mean they have a, a, a pathology problem or, or an insect problem. Disease diagnosis is just like riding a bike. Once you kind of learn how to ride a bike, you kind of remember how to ride a bike the rest of your life. You might fall down every once in a while, or you might need three wheels to stay up. And that's the same with plant pathology. Once you learn to recognize the symptoms of the pathogens and insects that are attacking your garden, you kind of remember them. Okay, so once you know what early blight looks like on tomato, you kind of remember that, because it always looks the same. Once you recognize the tomato anthracnose, which some of you may have in your garden, you know, it looks the same almost every year. Same with the leaf spots and things like that. So it's critically that you learn to diagnose things correctly so you know what they are, and then you know how to treat them. All right, and leaf spots, numbers of leaf spots in the home garden. There are a few very common ones, all right? The first one is tomato leaf spot, or septoria leaf spot on tomato. It always produces these round lesions with tan centers, and the fungus actually fruits, the fungus actually produces fruiting bodies in the center of these lesions, all right? The next time it rains, spores from this spot are gonna be splashed onto other spots on the leaf, and then you're gonna have more leaf spots. So each one of these spots you see either on the tomato or the septorion parsley here, you can see the fruiting bodies much clearer here on the parsley leaves. Each side of one of those fruiting bodies, there's thousands and thousands of spores that are being produced. The next time you overhead water or you get a big storm come through your backyard, those thousands and thousands of spores are going to be splashed everywhere. And then each one of those spores is going to start a new lesion or a new leaf spot. So each one of these spots is caused by just by a single spore infecting that leaf and then that Lesion develops and it produces thousands and thousands and thousands of more spores. That's why your nice tomato plants can go from looking nice and green, you know, three feet tall on a Friday, and by the next Friday, they're halfway defoliated. All your leaves are halfway gone the next. Anthracnoses. A lot of anthracnose pathogens out there, either in fruit and vegetables or in your ornamental plants. But tomato anthracnose, how many of you have seen this in your garden? Deal with it every year. How many of you have your garden in the same spot every year? Yeah. You know why? Because this pathogen overwinters in the soil every year. 
Again, you see all, see all the black fruiting bodies? Those are just masses of the fungus. And when this tomato rots, those little black bodies fall back into the soil. Over winter, you plant your tomatoes in there the next growing season. Those fungus starts to develop, and boom, it splashes back up on your fruit. And then you have the same problem over and over and over again. What's interesting about the tomato anthracnose pathogens is that these infections took place weeks ago when the fruit was still green. The fungus, the spores get splashed, they, they land on the green fruit, they infect the fruit, and they just sit there latently. They don't produce any symptoms until that fruit starts to change color or it starts to ripen. All right. So if you were a commercial farmer, say, and you had 100 acres of processing tomatoes that look like this, there's nothing you could have do right now to save your crop. All this damage was done four and five and six weeks ago when the fruit landed on the green fruit and just kind of sat there. All right. Again, once you have anthracnose in your garden, it's going to be there practically forever. And if you plant tomatoes in the same spot every year, you're going to be dealing with the same pathogen every year because the pathogen will over survive the winter in the soil. Unfortunately, the same pathogen that infects tomato can also infect pepper. Unlike tomato, as soon as that spore lands on the pepper fruit, infection occurs right away. Okay. On tomato, you won't have spore production. You just have these black fruiting bodies that survive the winter. All this pinkish-orange mass right here, those are all spores. All right. And there's literally billions of spores in this one spot. Too many to count. Again, the next time you overhead water or rain comes through, those spores are going to be splashed around on the peppers or tomatoes. And then you're going to have more lesions. The same pathogens that cause anthracnose on tomato and pepper were also cause fruit rot and strawberry. All right, so if you have a small strawberry planting in your garden, unfortunately I didn't put the picture, it kind of looks like this in here. If you have a small strawberry planting in your garden and you have anthracnose on strawberry, there's a good chance that, that strawberry infections, anthracnose, is going to end up on your tomatoes and or possibly on your peppers. This pathogen right here on peppers, it, it, commercial growers in New Jersey fear, fear this more than anything. This pathogen usually starts out only infecting a, a couple fruit in the entire field. We get a big storm come through New Jersey a week later you know, if the wind and rain's coming from this direction, that's the way the pathogen's going to spread. All right. And in a week, you can lose an acre or tens of acres of pepper to this pathogen. If you see this in your garden, whether it's on tomato, pepper, or strawberry, you want to pick these fruit and get them out of your garden. Because if you just let this lay in your garden because you don't want to eat it, it's just going to cause you problems the next growing season. If you leave these peppers or with these anthracnose lesions on, on, the, on the plant or you toss them in the row or on the garden edge, the spores are still going to splash wherever they are and cause you further problems. So you want to pull all this fruit out of the garden and then compost it or, or throw it away, put it in the bags and throw it away or toss it way back in the woods. Right. Root rots. Plant comes up, it suddenly wilts and dies. You don't know what happened. All right, it's most likely a fungal pathogen. There are a number of fungal pathogens in the home garden that once they're there, like I said earlier, they're going to be there forever. All right, Pythiums and phytophthora are one of those. All right, whenever you see a wilting plant in your garden where the entire plant wilts at once, you want to go back to the main stem. And you want to look to see if it's blackish or brown in color. All right. As you see here on eggplant, this is Phytophthora on eggplant and Phytophthora on, on, on pumpkin. All right, this stem has been infected by the fungus, and all that is dead tissue. 
Right? There's no more water going up that plant. Right? Hence the wilting. So this plant kills the stem, cuts off the flow of water in the vascular system at once, and that's why you see the entire plant wilt all at once. This plant's going to eventually die. This plant's on its way to dying, but that's what you want to look for, are blackish-brown stems. All right. Again, if you see this, you could easily pull this plant out of the garden, compost it, throw it away, and so forth. But these plants aren't going to recover. Okay. And these are diagnostic symptoms of root rot pathogens, damping up and wilts. Viruses, very common on certain crops in your home garden. I just chose pumpkin or cucurbits in general. All right. The thing about your viruses is that they're all transmitted or they end up in your garden from aphids. All right. Aphids that are infested are vectors of the virus. The aphid flies into your pumpkin or your squash or whatever, feeds a little bit, transmits the virus into the plant. The aphid moves on. The plant continues to grow. And then you see the virus symptoms develop on the leaves. You see these mosaic type patterns, very common in cucurbit crops. Right? If the infection occurs early enough in the season, it will actually go all the way into the fruit. So whenever you see pumpkin fruit that show this uneven ripening or this bumpiness, that's usually it means it's been infected by a, a virus. In cucurbit crops, whether it be pumpkin, squash, or gourd, there's about there's only five of them that you need to worry about. And they're all transmitted by the aphid. Right. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to control aphids in your home garden, especially the ones that are flying. They're flying, feed, and then they're gone. You got the virus, and there's nothing you can do. Of course, there's also the mildews. Everybody knows what powdery mildew is. Very, very common in cucurbits, again, as well as the ornamental side of things as well produces these pure white lesions, colonies. All right, powdery mildew is a little bit different than downy mildew. All right, powdery mildew in your home garden will infect any side of the, almost any part of the plant. The top of the leaves, the bottom of the leaves, the stems, the petals, and so forth. All right, and the colonies in almost all cases are pure white, dry and powdery-like, hence it gets its name. Downy mildews are a little bit different whether it be downy mildew on cucurbits or downy mildew on coleus or one of the other mints or something. Downy mildews only sporulate on the bottom sides of leaves. They won't sporulate because of the indirect UV light. Hence, the lead, the shade, they, they, shade, they sporulate on, on the bottom sides of leaves. Okay. So if you're seeing white sporulation all over the plant surface, you're most likely dealing with a powdery mildew of some sort. This happens to be greenhouse tomato here. If you're seeing white sporulation or purplish brown sporulation only on the bottom sides of the leaf surface, and you can see this with a little hand lens, you're most likely dealing with a downy mildew. Cucurbit downy mildew is a little bit of an outlier because it produces a purplish brown spore, very diagnostic. A lot of your other downy mildews produce white spores just like powdery mildew. So you like downy mildew with spinach and other crops. It'll look pure white as well, but you only see that sporulation on the bottom sides of the leaf surface. And that's how you tell the difference between a, a powdery mildew and, a, and a, a white downy mildew, is that the downy mildews will only sporulate on the bottom sides of the leaves. Let's talk about host ranges. Your host range of pathogens can be very large or very small. How many of you have house plants of anything? I guarantee at least one of your house plants has cucumber mosaic virus. You may see that mosaic type appearance on leaves of some sort, or you may see brown circular spots. CMV can infect over 800 plant species. All right. And we always tell our transplants producers in, around the state, if you're going transplants of any sort for yourself or somebody, don't put your houseplants in your greenhouse. Because if the aphids are on your houseplants and feed on your houseplants and then feed on your transplants, 
you probably just infected your, your transplants that you want to sell with CMV. Other pathogens, whether it be other fungi or bacteria, may only infect one host. All right. Your powdery mildews are all specific to their hosts. Like I said earlier, lilac powdery mildew won't jump to your rose, and rose powdery mildew won't show up on your cucurbit crops. All right. They're obligate parasites. Same thing with your downy mildews, very specific to their particular hosts. As I said earlier, all pathogens require certain environmental conditions in the host to develop, all right? For the home gardeners, you almost have to become, you know, mini meteorologists, all right? You have to pay attention to the weather. It's basically half my job sometimes. Is first thing I do in the morning is I turn on the weather so I know what's going on for the day. All right, the most important thing here to remember is temperature, your rainfall, your relative humidity, and your leaf wetness are all important factors for disease development. All right, that's what you want to monitor. And it's not surprising that most of your plant pathogens are going to develop at the same temperatures which are ideal for plant growth. So how do plant diseases get from place to place? We kind of covered it a little bit earlier, but most of your garden diseases are going to be soil-borne. All right. And once they're in the soil, they're going to be there for a very long time. All right. That's why crop rotation is so important. All right. These guys, your fusariums, your pythiums, your phytophthora, your sclerotinias, are going to sort of survive from year to year in your backyard or in your garden. Other pathogens are going to be windborne. All right. The basal downy mildew you, you deal with, your cucurbit powdery mildew your cucurbit downy mildew. All those pathogens originate in the south every spring. All right, like I said earlier, they won't survive in our region without a living host. So once your basil freezes out in the fall, once your pumpkin plants die, once your summer squash plants freeze out, the pathogen is going to die with them all right, because they need a living host. As we said earlier, some of your pathogens are going to come up from the south every year. So how does pumpkin powdery mildew get in New Jersey every year if it's not here now? Well, you have to remember in Florida, there's two growing seasons. In Florida, it's too hot to grow vegetables during the summer months. So they grow things from January to March, and then from, from uh, August or September until December. All right, so they start planting squash plants in Florida around the first of the year. That's where the powdery mildew survives. Then it warms up, and they start to plant squash in southern, I mean, northern Florida. A few weeks later, they plant squash in South Carolina. A few weeks later, as it warms up, they plant squash in North Carolina. And as they plant those crops up the East Coast, guess what? The pathogens just kind of follow the plantings and the cross, crops up the East Coast. And by, you know, June, late May, in our area, when we're planting, the pathogen eventually shows up. So that's how things get here. Same thing with that basal downy mildew. So we said wind, rain, and soil splash are all important factors that lead to disease. This is important. A few technical terms here. Your primary inoculum, the pathogen. This is the pathogen that overwinters and causes the first infections of the growing season. That's when you want to be able to recognize the disease because that's the best time for you to take measures to control it. Okay, that's the first time you see a leaf spot on your tomato plant in the spring. Or the first time, the first powdery mildew lesion you see on the underside of a cucurbit leaves. That's when you want to start thinking about these pathogens, if not before. All right, because all those early infections are going to lead to all this secondary inoculum production during the growing season. As I said earlier, on those leaf spots of septoria, it only takes one spore to cause a lesion, and that lesion produces thousands and thousands of more spores, which are then spread. All right. You get a rainstorm once a week for four weeks, you're going to have a major issues. All right. Because each time the rain comes in, you're going to get a disease cycle, and you're going to end up with more and more disease. Compost, it needs to decompose and it needs to reach a certain temperature. That temperature is basically a killing temperature. 
that kills everything that's present as that compost starts to decompose. It's the heat that's important. All right, and you got to be able to get that heat in the compost pile so everything dies. Everything dies at a certain temperature, and then it starts to break down more and so forth. But if, like I said, if you're my father, my father just takes whatever's in the kitchen and dumps it in the pile in the backyard, and it looks, attracts critters, you know. He's not really composting. He's just making a mess in the backyard, <laughs> all right, which bugs my mom to death because she doesn't want rodents and stuff in their backyard, all right. This is a uh, phytophthora on pumpkin. Again, all that white you see on the bottom side of the leaves, those are all spores. It'll take you a lifetime to count every single one of them. The next time it rains, the spores get splashed, kills the plant next to it. You get another rain, more spores get splashed, kills the plant the, over, the row over, and it just works its way through your garden. All right. Weather conditions often dictate which diseases are most likely to develop. All right. Powdery mildew is, 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 is a good exception to the rule. Powdery mildew, of all powdery mildew, is like hot, dry weather. All right. If it's going to be hot and dry for the next four weeks, I guarantee we're going to see a lot more powdery mildew out on the farms than, than I will see downy mildew. All right. Downy mildew is generally like cooler, wetter weather. All right. So if you know what's going to happen in the next 10 days, you can kind of Plan ahead, all right? And that's what farmers do. You, they use the weather forecast to dictate what they're going to do or when they're going to spray their fungicides or insecticides. They use models or other graphical references, all right? So controlling plant disease prevention is the key. It's learning, recognizing what's in your garden so you know how to control it, all right? The easiest way to prevent disease in your home garden are the plant vegetables that have genetic resistance to the diseases you're worried about. Then you don't have to worry about spraying, you don't have to worry about a whole lot of other things. Okay. Good cultural practices, you know, and good pest measures. Everybody starts with a nice looking garden in May. And then July rolls around and it gets hot and you get busy at work, and you forget the water, and you see little weeds, and then a week later you see bigger weeds, and then a week later, that's all you see is weeds. All right, we've all been there. All right, then what do you do? Well, you have all this extra vegetative material in your garden that's shading out the crop you want to grow. It's trapping humidity, it's trapping moisture, and then bada boom, bada bing, you got something, a disease that's killing your squash or your tomato, or you can't, if you can't find your tomato plants in your garden, you know, <laughs> that's typically a bad thing. So basically, IPM uses a, utilizes a variety of pest management measures that include cultural, physical, biological, and chemical ways to keep pests at an acceptable level. You don't have to keep all disease or insects out of your garden. You just got to keep most of them to a level where they're not going to destroy or kill your crop. All right, the native anthracnose, we talked about it earlier. If there's one disease in the home garden that everybody has, it's this guy right here, all right? You want to control anthracnose, you see these fruit, pull them off the vine and, and get rid of them. Don't allow them back into the soil, all right? Very important, it causes heavy yield loss. You won't just find one fruit with anthracnose. Every fruit in the garden will have it, all right? Again, it's good over winter, good rotation, we control. If you can keep those tomato fruit off the soil surface, that's a very good bet. All right, because remember, the pathogen's in the soil and it has to splash up into the fruit. The higher those fruit are in the air, the less likely the soil is going to splash up and get on them. All right, you can cage them, stake them, or if you, if you like the mulch, you can put them on mulch. The mulch simply ask, acts as a physical barrier to prevent the spores from being splashed up into the fruit. All right. Early blight, unlike anthracnose, early blight will infect both the leaves and the stem end of the fruit. 
The diagnostic features of early blight, it produces these brown lesions with these black, con black concentric sp spore rings. If you see a, a lesion that looks like that, you know you're dealing with early blight. You can live with it if it gets on the foliage to an extent. You know, if it starts to infect your fruit, you won't be able to, to harvest that fruit. All right. Just like septoria, early blight will lead to premature defoliation. If you get enough of these infections on the leaves, the leaves will just start to die and fall off the plant. All right. It's going to lower your yield. Again, you can use mulch to prevent soil splashing. And you can use protectant fungicides. How many of you spray fungicides in your home garden? One? All right. <laughs> yep. Most of you aren't. My dad tried to grow peaches without spraying once. It was a disaster. He picked three peaches in 10 years <laughs> before he decided to cut the trees down. All right. Some things are just almost impossible to grow in our region because of the weather. Let's just face it. <laughs> we, uh, he lives in Ohio. It's the same problem. Okay. Anything you buy over the counter at the Home Depot, your garden center, it's going to be generally safe to use. All right. So with that said, that's my two cents. All right. <laughs> Most of the stuff that you guys spray commercially it's very safe to use now. A lot of the products that get some people up and worry are no longer on the market. All right. The government's done a pretty good job of taking all that stuff away. All the old biocides that kill everything. Uh, the arsenic, gone. All right. Things like that are already gone. It's to the point now where our fungicides and herbicides are so specific that the pathogens and the weeds can develop resistance to them. That's the, down, the downside, well, the good side of having pesticides that are so cross, crop and pest specific is that the pathogens, the weeds, and insects develop resistance to them easier because they don't affect non-target organisms. Bacterial, how many grow to, tomato growers? How many grow heirloom tomatoes? All right. Heirloom tomatoes is the reason why nobody grows them anymore. It's because they get every disease under the sun. All right, they're hard to grow. One of the more important ones, they get all the bacterial diseases. If you grow heirloom tomatoes, more than likely, at some point in your life, you're going to have major problems with bacterial diseases. All right, bacterial leaf spot. Symptoms look like this. Large scabby. This pointer, I can't see a pointer at all. On the left, and then bacterial speck on the right. Very diagnostic symptoms on infected tomato fruit. Again, it's like riding the bike. Once you recognize it, you never forget it. All right. For all your bacterial disease control, it's crop rotations, two to three years, because the bacteria is going to survive on plant debris that gets rotivated or rototilled back into the soil. All right. Heirloom tomatoes. Again, you, your seed can actually be infested with the bacteria, and you wouldn't even know it. So you want to buy your seed from a reputable source. Crop rotation. For a home gardener, if you can move something 10 feet, 15 feet, do it. All right? If you're a commercial farmer, if you can move stuff acres away, that's what you want to do. The goal is not to plant the tomatoes in the same spot year after year after year. All right? If you only got a, if you got a 20 foot garden, plant them at one edge one year, and then plant them on the other side the next year. Then plant them in the middle of the year after that, then go back to one of the edges. As far as you can. More importantly, you know, and rotate away from as long as you can. Most of you are going to put tomatoes in your garden year after year. That's almost a done deal. So you're not going to really ever get away from tomatoes. Okay. Again, use your clean seed, all right? Ask if it's been treated and, and buy clean transplants, all right? I talked to the master gardeners. If there's a transplant, or on the 50% off rack, and they got large brown spots all over the leaves, you probably don't want to bring them home and put them in your garden. All right, buy the healthiest looking stuff. Don't bring in stuff you know that may have a problem into your yard. Okay. 
And when disease is present or anticipated, try not to work in your gardens when your plant surfaces are wet. When's the best time to water your garden? In the morning. Why do you water in the morning? That's right. So everything is dry, you know, by 4 o'clock in the afternoon. If you wait and water after you get home from work at 6 p.m. and forget to turn it off at 9 p.m., those leaves in your garden are going to be wet from 6 p.m. and to probably 10 a.m. the next morning. All right, so that's like 16 hours of leaf wetness that is ideal or could be ideal for disease development, and that's something you, you don't want. Again, and it's recognizing the early symptoms of, of the diseases, uh, as we talked about. Bacterial disease control. If you're interested in controlling any bacterial diseases in the home garden, pick a product that has copper in it. You can buy organic copper, army approved coppers, or other coppers. It's a nice, it's a, a general protectant. Again, rotate, pl plant your resistant varieties. Start with clean seed or transplants. Keep your fruit off the soil surface. Keep your leaves dry. Keep your weeds down. And, and fungicides if necessary. Again, if you're choosing resistant tomato varieties, look at the tags. All right, I tell people, just don't look at the catalog and look at the pretty pictures. Actually pay attention to all the acronyms that come along with the pretty picture. And that's going to tell you if it's got disease resistance, insect resistance, and so forth. So celebrity. Anybody grow celebrities? Tomatoes? Been around forever. I picked them as a youngster. All right? It's an all-American winner. It's got determinate growth habit. It also has a VFFNT on the tag. All right? That means it has some verticillin resistance. It has resistance to two races of fusarium wilt. It has resistance to nematodes, as well as resistance to the bacco mosaic virus. All right, that's where you want to start, are choosing plant varieties that carry some sort of resistance to your more common pathogens, and most of them do. There's very good resistance in cucurbit crops to powdery mildew. If you go through the catalogs, look for varieties that carry the PMR, the PMRR, the PMT, acronym with them. That means they're powdery mildew tolerant. That's where you want to start to solve, help solve your, your powdery mildew problems in the home garden. This is what disease can do. This is a, about a 40-acre butternut squash field in South Jersey. I was on the farm on a Friday with the agent. The field looked perfect. Rain came in over the weekend, went back on a Tuesday, and he lost the entire field because the fungus had come in. And this is cucurbit downy mildew. And faded the leaves heavily, caused all these leaves to turn brown. And what happens here is that if you lose your canopy or the foliage, you open up the fruit to sun scald. All right, it doesn't take a lot of afternoon sun in the late fall to burn those fruit up. So he lost 40 acres over a 48-hour period because he wasn't anticipating downy mildew and he didn't have any protection on to prevent it. So if each one of these fruit are worth a buck, you know, it adds up very quickly. Ideally, at this point in the season, you'd be looking at reports that we put out because we track where this pathogen is, and you want to have something down to protect the leaves before the pathogen shows up on your farm or in your region. And that's what he failed to do there. Is these were just plants that had never been sprayed before. Unfortunately, we had a bad storm sneak through and brought the disease, and boom, he lost his whole field and, you know, over the weekend. If you go to the local home, the question is, is, is there one fungicide for the home garden that I would recommend overall? One of them would be the coppers. You're, li you're, you're, li you're so limited on your options. One of your options is going to be coppers. All right, if you've got fire blight, and your apple trees are pear, or you got bacterial problems on your tomatoes, I would recommend the copper. There's Omri-approved coppers and other coppers. The other active ingredient that you would look for is called chlorothalonil. All right, you will look at the actual label. Don't worry about what they call it. It's going to have the, you know, they're going to call it whatever they want. But if you look at the active ingredient on the front, on the label, on the front, it'll say active ingredient, and underneath it, it'll say chlorothalonil. Chloro. Thalonil. The, the, the active ingredient label is going to be white 
It's going to say active and green. I should have put a picture on it, and then you see chlorothalonil. Chlorothalonil is a very common fungicide. They, it's used in a lot of different things, and it's a very good protectant fungicide. But you want to put it down before your disease shows up.